Have you ever dealt with jaundice in your newborn and wondered whether or not the treatment that you were being given was really necessary? Long separations from your baby and intense phototherapy treatments, lots of supplementation of formula. Let's talk about newborn jaundice today and the various types of jaundice and how you can advocate for feeding your baby your own milk when you know what type of jaundice your baby has. Let's get into it. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was. Having known only a handful of people who had ever done it and only seeing it up close a couple of times, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a childbirth educator, and an internationally board-certified lactation consultant, or an IBCLC. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore the systemic medical and cultural barriers that make feeding our babies so difficult, so that you know your baby feeding struggles are not your fault. And your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. My hopes for today in talking about jaundice is that you feel that you understand jaundice and the best treatments for jaundice, given the type of jaundice that your newborn has. And then you're able to then make decisions clearly and without fear and that you can take the information that I'll present today to your healthcare providers to have the necessary conversations. So babies, when they are in utero, have extra red blood cells. And these red blood cells are used to transport the oxygen they receive through the placenta so that they get the oxygen they need to live and survive and grow. After the birth, these extra red blood cells are no longer needed. And so they are broken down and eliminated through the stool, through poop. Now, bilirubin is a byproduct of this breaking down of the red blood cells. And jaundice occurs as bilirubin begins to accumulate in the baby's blood and enters the skin and the muscles and the mucous membranes. So as you can see, jaundice is a very normal physiological process. More than 80% of newborns become visibly jaundiced, if you can believe that. And Among nursing babies, bilirubin levels can remain elevated for 12 to 15 weeks. And that is totally normal. And in fact, many scientists now think that this rise in the bilirubin levels serves as a protective mechanism for the baby. Because babies don't naturally have antioxidants. And so this rise in the bilirubin levels provides an antioxidant effect for the babies against free radicals. And free radicals can cause injuries such as necrotizing intercolitis, retinopathy of prematurity, and other injuries. So it is a protective mechanism. Which isn't surprising. Anything that we can see visibly in over 80% of babies, there has to be a reason for it. So there are several types of jaundice. Now, pathological jaundice is way less common than what we call physiological jaundice. Pathological jaundice is a potentially very serious condition in newborns. And this is when bilirubin is rising higher than 5 milligrams per deciliter per day, or it gets higher than 17 milligrams per deciliter. And it appears earlier than physiological jaundice. So within the first 24 hours, you will see that jaundice. And the various causes 
of pathological jaundice could be a blood type incompatibility, infections, liver disorders, metabolic conditions. And so if a newborn does have pathological jaundice, this is going to be noticed right away and they will probably be put on a treatment protocol very quickly. It can be scary to hear that your baby has something that needs treatment for. So that is pathological jaundice and we will get to treatments in just a second. But in in most cases of even pathological jaundice, nursing really should continue. Last night, as a family, we had the rare opportunity to just have one child at home. We had not eaten dinner yet, and it was getting pretty late, but we asked him, it's just the three of us, what would you like to do? And my son said he wanted to take a walk at a nearby reservoir. And neither my husband and I were stressed out about this because we had a refrigerator full of feast and fettle, which had delivered home cooked meals right to our front door that we knew when we came home from our walk, all we would have to do was just heat and serve it. So off we went on our walk right around sunset, around the reservoir. It was beautiful, just the three of us and our dog. And then we came home and within 15 minutes, we had the most delicious coconut crusted cod and roasted cauliflower and we ate it while we played uno together and the cleanup was so easy and it made our evening so amazing after a full day of work and allowed us to connect with our child and this is why I am so happy that Feast and Fettle is a partner of the podcast because I truly believe that anything that allows families to spend more time together and less time worrying about all the things they need to do like getting dinner on the table is something I can get behind. So if you would like to see what Feast and Fettle can do for your family, go to feastandfettle.com and use my code M-I-L-K to get $30 off your first week's order. And let somebody else do the cooking for you and just go take that walk. In addition to the pathological jaundice, there is what we call physiological jaundice. And physiological jaundice is split into two categories. One is suboptimal intake jaundice, which is essentially meaning the infant is not taking in enough breast milk to then have the bilirubin break down and be brought out of the body through stooling. And so with this suboptimal intake jaundice, you really do need to be working with a qualified IBCLC to figure out why is the infant not taking in enough breast milk. And when an infant has suboptimal intake jaundice, Often it gets recommended just to feed formula. But what we know now is that when we improve intake of breast milk, that is what leads to the better jaundice outcomes, decreasing those bilirubin levels. And then there is prolonged jaundice associated with breast milk which is higher bilirubin levels that stays in the bloodstream for up to two to three months, which is actually quite normal. Um, We see this in 21% of breastfeeding babies. And it is quite possible that this really just is a part of that protective mechanism. And as long as those levels are staying below that 15 milligram per deciliter, then it's really nothing to be super concerned about. Um, And this is as a result of breastfeeding. Now, let's talk about how we know the differences between suboptimal intake jaundice and this prolonged jaundice associated with breast milk. As opposed to this pathological jaundice, which I already discussed, which happens right away under the 24 hour mark. The difference between suboptimal intake jaundice and breast milk jaundice or prolonged jaundice associated with breast milk, they both have the same onset. Usually 
two to five days of age is when it onsets. But with suboptimal intake jaundice, it's usually resolved by around two weeks. And with this prolonged jaundice, it may last up to three months. With the suboptimal intake jaundice, there is ongoing weight loss in those first couple of weeks. So they're not getting back to their birth weight at the time that we would expect. And with the breast milk jaundice, they're gaining above 30 grams per day. And then stool output is the other thing that we look at. So with the suboptimal intake jaundice, they are stooling less than five times per day with the color being black, brown, or green. Once they are getting enough breast milk, that color changes to yellow. And so with the breast milk jaundice, they have more than eight stools a day and they have a yellow color. And then same with urine. So with suboptimal intake jaundice, they have less than five peas a day and it has those uric acid crystals or that brick color. And then with breast milk jaundice, they are peeing eight or more times a day with a yellow or clear color. With suboptimal intake, they may be fussy and difficult to settle between feedings or sleepy and difficult to wake for feeding. So either one of those scenarios can lead to not taking in enough breast milk. So the biggest treatment for jaundice is to optimize nursing if a family is choosing to nurse or feed human milk to their baby. So the best practices to follow in the hospital to ensure that nursing happens is early skin-to-skin contact and often skin-to-skin contact. Learning hand expression is great to, for increasing milk supply. I don't often encourage all of my families to pump because that just adds in an extra complication that is unnecessary. But learning to hand express, however, is really good for milk supply. So that can help when babies have any jaundice. And then making sure that baby has a nice deep latch and seeking out help from an IBCLC when the baby doesn't have a good latch. And if anybody is telling you the latch looks good, but the latch doesn't feel good, speak up, be vocal and say, no, it doesn't feel good. And get someone who is going to trust you and believe you when you say it doesn't feel good to try to figure out why it's not feeling good. If you are not getting the help that you need, it is your prerogative to hire a private practice IBCLC to come in and help you manage breastfeeding. You can absolutely do that, especially if your baby has been diagnosed with something like jaundice, like suboptimal intake jaundice of the newborn after 24 hours, and you are being encouraged to supplement with formula. Because what starts to happen is when this jaundice begins to develop, healthcare providers know that the baby needs to poop more to get this bilirubin out of the system. And so then they just start recommending formula supplementation instead of helping the families to figure out why the baby is not transferring enough milk at the body. And often the reason the baby is not transferring enough milk at the body is because babies, every single baby I see in the hospital is swaddled, for instance. And swaddling is great to keep babies quiet and not making a lot of noise. It is not great for noticing the earliest signs of hunger because they can't start wiggling around and showing that they're restless and moving their hands to their mouth, which are all the earliest feeding cues. When babies start to cry to indicate hunger, it's almost too late. They can't get organized enough to breastfeed. And I'll do a whole episode on this because I think it's really important. Yeah, so we need to optimize breastfeeding in order to improve this suboptimal intake jaundice of the newborn. And so if you are being asked to supplement with formula, you can say, I would like to um, see the lactation consultant, or you can go online and you can hire an IBCLC. If you would like to hire me, if I am somewhere near you, I can come to you in person and provide that support. 
or you can hire me virtually. You can go to www.quabemberservices.com and I would love to do a virtual consultation with you. All you need is your phone, a laptop, a computer, and it's pretty amazing how much I can do to support you even if I'm not in the room because I try to practice as much as possible being hands off with my clients because in the end, if I am super hands on and helping you feed your baby, then when I walk out of the room, you might not be able to do it on your own. So go to my website, book me. I am happy to help you with any issues you are having, whether it relates to jaundice, low milk supply, if you're trying to wean your baby, whatever it is, I'm here for you. That's what I love to do is support clients and helping them feel less anxiety and more secure in feeding their babies. So hire that IBCLC to help optimize breastfeeding. It does appear that many severely jaundiced babies appear sleepy or disinterested in feeding. If baby is super, super sleepy, then we are going to keep that baby on the chest as much as possible to trigger those newborn feeding behaviors. And then, of course, we're going to then move on to trying to express breast milk. And then if we do need to feed formula, there are specific formulas that are recommended for jaundice babies. And these are not always available in the hospital, but an alimentum formula and a nutramogen formula are recommended over other infant formulas because they reduce bilirubin levels faster than other formulas. And they contain an ingredient that is more effective at preventing bilirubin in the baby's intestine from being reabsorbed. And they are less likely to sensitize newborns to allergy. And then it's always important to know that the formula supplementation does not have to be ongoing. It can be just for the amount of time we need to get those bilirubin numbers down. Many healthcare providers suggest suspending breastfeeding and moving strictly to formula during this time. But a temporary weaning does put nursing at risk. And when nursing is interrupted for 12, 24, or 48 hours, it can lead to lower milk supply overall. And so it's really important to have these discussions with your healthcare provider if this is being recommended. And, um, and then, of course, in addition to supplementing with the feeds and optimizing breastfeeding, often infants with jaundice do need phototherapy. And usually this means that they're laid naked with their eyes covered under a white, blue, or green fluorescent lights. These are called Billy lights. And this light is absorbed by the Billy Rubin under the baby's skin. And it changes it to a water-soluble form that al allows the baby to eliminate it without needing to process first in his liver. So in the U.S., the American Academy of Pediatrics practice guidelines for starting phototherapy on hospitalized newborns, and the risk factors are defined as bilirubin levels in the high risk zone if three days or older, which is anything above 16 milligrams per deciliter of bilirubin, jaundice visible during the first 24 hours, blood group incompatibility or other hemolytic blood disease or other blood disease, an older sibling that received phototherapy, significant bruising or cephalohematoma, and exclusive breastfeeding with feeding problems with a weight loss at or above 12%, and people of East Asian race. And also they're looking at the rate at which the bilirubin is rising. And then the guidelines are a little bit different for premature babies. But it is important to know that the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine wrote in its protocol that phototherapy can be used while continuing full breastfeeding, or it can be combined with supplementation of express breast milk or infant formula if maternal supply is insufficient. Only in extenuating circumstances is temporary interruption of breastfeeding with replacement feeding necessary. And it is noted that there was no difference in outcomes for babies who took breaks for up to 30 minutes or even a little bit more for breastfeeding. So the babies came out of the lights for that amount of time for breastfeeding. There was no difference in outcomes for those babies. If a baby is at dangerously high rates 
of bilirubin, then it is possible that an exchange transfusion will be done where small amounts of the baby's blood are continuously replaced with donor blood. And this can often happen in sick or very preterm babies. Now, I must say that uh, one other treatment that I'm going to bring up that even as, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to a family, look, you know, if you're worried about jaundice, you can always sit in a window with your baby in the sunlight. This is something that's been done for a long time. But it turns out that parents really are cautioned about using indirect sunlight as an alternative treatment for jaundice. And the reason is because the harmful UVA and UVB rays from the sun that cause skin damage just cannot be filtered through in that setting. And so I guess technically as an IBCLC, I should not be telling families that they can sit in the sun. They are looking for ways to develop some sunlight canopies that do filter the sun through, especially to be used in areas where families don't have access to the billy lights. And the research is indicating that it's just impossible to engage to to gauge the amount of light the baby receives and its effect on the bilirubin levels, and it could cause a dangerous increase in body temperature and burn the baby's skin. And I definitely don't want to be encouraging parents to do anything like that. So there is everything you need to know about jaundice in your newborn baby. There are various types. There's this physiological jaundice, which we expect to see, and then pathological jaundice, which happens really quickly within the first 24 hours, which means that there is an underlying root cause from either a blood incompatibility issue or a disease or bruising of the head that we need to figure out. And then with the physiological jaundice, we have these two categories, that that comes from suboptimal intake, and then that is just this prolonged breast milk jaundice, which we think actually has some protective effects for the newborn. So with that being said, if you have any further questions about breastfeeding your baby, or if you would like to discuss this further, if you have experienced treatment of the jaundiced newborn, yourself. I would love to hear what your experiences are. I would love to hear the ways that you were supported in continuing breastfeeding or the ways that you were discouraged from breastfeeding while your infant was being treated for jaundice. So in order to communicate with me about that, you can join my Milk Making Minutes community group on Facebook. I would love to see you there. The link is always in the show notes. That's where we have those sorts of discussions. So pop in there and tell me all about your experiences. And then finally, just a reminder that if you are wanting to spend more time with your family this summer and less time worrying about what to feed them, considering that during the summertime when they're home, it seems like you're constantly having to feed them already, then take one meal off your plate. It could be the dinner time. It could be the lunches you pack. It could be snacks. There are a variety of options to choose from at feastandfettle.com. You can get $30 off your first week's delivery going right to your front door. So go to feastandfettle.com, enter my code MILK, M-I-L-K for that discount. And then let me know if you decide to order. I want to hear your experiences too, because I've just loved being a customer. Thanks.